So Holly Roberts, Executive Director of Bible Study Fellowship, is here to talk about this year's study in Revelation. Holly, thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Holly, we're just coming off the, the Gospel of John, and it was such an amazing study. And now we're pretty much going right into the book of Re Revelation, and that was John's last book. How have you seen it change lives, the, the book of John? You know, one of the beauties of Bible Study Fellowship it's, is it's a global ministry. And one of the great privileges of my role and those who serve on the staff of Bible Study Fellowship is we get to hear stories of God at work around the world. And so just to give you a glimpse of God at work around the world, in Impal, India, this year, we have a young adult class that suffered great persecution personally. Uh, homes were burned. People were driven out of the city. But our leaders in the midst of that, these young adult leaders, didn't shrink back. And in fact, they were rather emboldened by the persecution. So when they couldn't meet in person, they found a way to meet online. And instead of the class attendance dwindling because of persecution or suffering or fear, the class attendance grew. And these members uh, boldly advanced to God's word. They were in refugee camps. They were in shelters. They were in family homes across India, where less than 2% of the population is pro professes Christianity. I mean, they are boldly advancing God's word. And one leader sent word back to us, and this is what she said. When the members were lacking, the leaders would testify of God's goodness. And when the leadership struggled, our members would encourage them. And that would somehow carry us through the week. And it made her emotional to even share that story. She said, only God could have done that for us. And, you know, when they had to scatter, when they had to leave their homes and leave their cities behind because of danger, Instead of being discouraged, they started new groups in the places where they landed, which reminds me of the apostles scattering in Acts chapter 8. And as I was thinking about this story and thinking about this group, I was also reminded of the church, the letter to the church in Philadelphia in Revelation 3, because this group is one that endured patiently and with great joy. And while their story isn't over and the tensions are still high, this group is putting their life back together in fellowship and in community, anchored to God's word, anchored to Bible study. Now, there's another place where we have a presence, and it's a war-torn, rather closed country, and so I won't name it. But here's the situation. The military is corrupt. The food supply is scarce. The currency is destabilized, and so even the normal trading that goes on every day that we would be used to isn't happening in that way. And people are being forced out of their homes. And, and there's a group, there's a group of 17 that meet on the ground in this war-torn country, and they sent back word to us after studying John because they wanted us to know what they were learning. And here's what they were learning. Number one, prayer is power. As they would navigate the explosive news and events, they said it would drive us crazy. But we know that kneeling before God and crying and praying fervently to him brought us the peace and calm that we needed. So they wanted us to know prayer is power. But they also wanted us to know the Bible had become their food. So the food and currency were scarce, but the Bible had become their food. And what they realized as they studied the book of John was that Jesus came to this world, and like them, he also experienced trouble, but he kept his focus on God. And they also said this, which I thought was fascinating, without the internet and Wi-Fi, we are not distracted, and we can focus on God. So stories like that come in from around the world, but it's not just stories from around the world. We have a children's leader here in Houston who has longed for her mother-in-law who grew up in church but hadn't spent much time in church since she was a child. So this 85-year-old woman now, nearly blind, almost homebound, living in Massachusetts, 
This children's leader has wanted her mother-in-law to come to BSF for years. And during COVID, that became possible because the mother-in-law could get on BSF online. And so every week since COVID started, this children's leader in Houston reaches out to her mother-in-law in Massachusetts and helps connect her to her BSF online group. Well, this year, while studying the book of John, the group leader said, just in an offhanded comment, said, next week, our focus will be the Holy Spirit. And this woman in Massachusetts, who only grew up in church as a child, but really had little exposure to the Bible, spent the whole week wondering, who is the Holy Spirit? What is this about? And she actually shared with us all week long, I thought about the Holy Spirit. And one day, I sat in a chair, chair near my kitchen window with an open Bible in my lap. And the sunshine illuminated the pages of John's gospel. And I, as I searched, this is her story, as I searched for the Holy Spirit. And that's when I saw it. John 14, 26 told me who the Holy Spirit was. And I realized in that moment, I was reading the Bible with my own eyes. Now, she can't read without a magnifying glass that makes it really big on the page. But as the sun shined through the window and helped her, she read with her own eyes without the magnifying glass, John 14, 26, and she began to understand who the Holy Spirit is. And she counts that as a miracle because in those moments, it was more than just God giving sight to her physical eyes. It was God giving sight to her spiritual eyes as she began to understand a relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So we hear stories like that. And then, you know, I reached out to a friend and I said, tell me what happened in your group this year. The, the story you might not pass along because you might just think it's a small one. And what she shared was there was a group that was put together, a group of 15 women, they were put together. They didn't know each other. And in fact, if you just looked at the group, there wasn't anything that made you think, aha, this is a group that should be connected. But as this group that had put, been put together people who didn't know each other and at face value probably seemed like a random group. As this group studied God's word together, they began to realize that they had something in common. Every single woman in this group had gone through great loss and they were recovering from deep grief. In fact, as God would walk them through the word of God, it was a demonstration of both Bible study and fellowship this group who had never met, um, and several would share that they didn't want to get out of bed, they didn't want to leave their homes. God put them together, and together they walked through the study of John, and God used the fellowship of the group to lift their eyes and lift their heads and even physically get them out of bed each week. What I love, I mean, I, I could spend the whole time telling you stories and they could come from all over the world. But what I thought was interesting about this particular set of stories is that they have that God meets us in our time of need. God always shows us the relevance of his word to our current circumstances. And then God showed himself and is showing himself to be greater than any question they have, any struggle they have, any grief that they have. And what you see in these stories is the value of Bible study and fellowship. Bible study, fellowship. So John was a great year because our God is a great God and his word does not return void when we study his word. And such a powerful, powerful study. Wow. Those are some great stories, Holly. I could do it all day long, I'm telling you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And I bet you, between you and your staff, you're all talking about this, like, you know, oh, I heard this happen here, and oh, I mm -hmm. heard this happen there. And I'm sure there's people out there right now that are listening that's, that was in, the, was in the group and said, this happened, this magnificent thing happened in our group. And, and if you, it did, put it in the comments so that I can yeah. send it to Holly and she'll be able to hear it and know it. Um, and the study was so great. So, you know, now we're going to fast forward and go to the book of Revelation. 
who wrote the book of Revelation and why? And there may be some people out there that don't know who did. Absolutely. Well, several times in Revelation chapter one, the author is identified as John. And this is most certainly John the apostle, John the brother of James, John the close friend and disciple of Jesus, who also authored the book of John that we've just finished studying. And then first, second, and third John also in the New Testament. But the book, the it's pretty clear from scripture and scholars agree all the way back from the very beginning that the author was likely John the apostle and certainly the one who we've just studied his work um, in the gospel according to John. And it's so wonderful that we just went right into it from John. So now that's his last book. But if someone has never studied this book of Revelation before, what could they expect from it? Mm. Well, you can expect that it will impact your life. You can expect practical and relevant truth coming through the pages each and every week. You know, John wrote this gospel um, because God told him to. So right away in John, in Revelation chapter one, you get this instruction from the Lord that says, write down what I'm about to show you. And he wrote during a time when the Roman Empire had intensified its persecution of Christians. And so he's writing at a time when Christians would have been tempted to compromise their belief. He's writing at a time when to stand firm in your faith would have an earthly consequence. He's writing at a time when there's a great temptation to fit in with the culture instead of stand out with your faith. And he's writing at a time when some in the church are following false, following false teachers and even abandoning the love that God calls us to. He's writing at a time when some in the church have a reputation of being alive, but they're really dead. In other words, they're pretending they're not really part of the church. And he's writing at a time when people are persevering through difficulties. So what can you expect? you can expect messages that address situations like that being given from God, a revelation from God, which is also about God, to the world of that day. But it's not just to the world of that day. It is to the world of our day. You know, one scholar that I followed described it this way. He said, the book of Revelation describes God on the move against the forces of evil and reminds us the panic, the panic of the unbelieving world should not enter into the believing world. So you can expect timely, practical, relevant truth. I would also say that you can expect to be reassured that regardless of what's going on in the world around you, God is on his throne and Jesus is Lord of all. And, you know, I can't think of any place in the entire world right now where people are sitting back thinking, it's all good. We're comfortable. There are no problems. Like, I I can't go anywhere in the world. I can start picking apart countries and telling you what these people are struggling with. Or maybe in the United States, some of the questions that are being raised in some of the content on social media and some of the panic that people are trying to press into us. But you can be, you can expect to be reassured that regardless of what you read in the news, regardless what happens to you tomorrow, the surprising news you may receive, God is on his throne and Jesus is Lord of all. And you can be expected, you can expect to have truth poured into you each and every week. Truth that fuels perseverance. Truth that fuels purity. Truth that reminds you of God's power and God's victory. So it is the perfect time to be in the book of Revelation. And that's how God works, right? It's always the perfect time to be in his word. It is the perfect time to be in the book of Revelation. Holly, thank you for that, because I know that there are a lot of people out there who really needed to hear just those words about what's going on in the world right now and what we should be 
honing into, and that's the Bible, and just to listen to his word through this Revelation study. So, you know, there's so many symbols in Revelation. You know, people don't really understand, like, some of the things that, that they'll be reading. What do they mean? Ah, well, there's an easy question. So let me just knock that one out. <laughs> not really, not really. Um, let me start by saying this. For those of you who aren't familiar with the book of Revelation, it is what we call um, apocalyptic literature. It's a very specific type of writing in scripture. And the word apocalypse means revelation. And that usually refers to something, the uncovering of something that's been hidden. Okay, so there's an uncovering that's happening in this book. And in Revelation, there are symbols that you will come across. Um, as John is using these symbols to explain things to his reader. Now, the symbols, there's, there's all different kinds of symbols. So sometimes we're told the meaning of the symbols. As you read through Revelation chapter one, you're going to get to the end of that chapter and you're going to hear about the, the seven stars and the golden lampstands. And then John's going to say the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands or are the seven churches. So sometimes when you're reading through the book, the symbols will be revealed. You'll understand what they are because the author will tell us. Sometimes the symbols in Revelation point back to an image or a story that occurred in another place of scripture. So you're going to hear a read in Revelation of a lamb looking as if he has been slain. But the lamb imagery starts almost at the beginning of scripture and works its way even into the book of John, where we see, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And now we have the lamb looking as if he's been slain. Another great example of that is the perfect cube at the end of Revelation mirrors the perfect cube in the Holy of Holies. And so there's the symbolism that links together scripture that knits together. So sometimes that's what the symbols are. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the symbols are tied to the culture or the history or the language of John's day. And so that's an opportunity to sit back and understand this symbol was giving a thousand words through one picture uh, to John's reader of his day. And we'll help you navigate those symbols in, within the text, within the study. Mm -hmm. And then there are a whole other set of symbols. But we can't tell you exactly what they mean. <laughs> but our goal in BSF is not to explain every symbol. Actually, we're not going to debate whether all of these symbols should be taken as literal or symbolic. Our goal in the book of Revelation, and really in the Bible in general, is to, with great humility, instead of getting lost in the symbols, is to remember the greater truth that all the symbols point to. Because regardless of which symbol is being used at any given moment, all the symbols are pointing to a greater truth and that is that God wins. God is on the throne. Jesus is Lord of all. And God wins. Mm -hmm. So we will work through symbols, but we won't get caught up by symbols. And we're not going to let those symbols take our eyes off the greater truth of the message of the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Well, so many things are ramping up right now in the world that everybody thinks that, oh, this is it. This is the end of the world. But the, how does Revelation describe the end of the world? Well, what it tells us is that God has a plan to complete his redemption plan for humanity. So Revelation describes the consummation or the completion of God's redemptive plan for humanity. And that's the story in Revelation. You see, the Bible is really God's grand plan um, uh, encapsulated by one central theme, and that's the restoration of all things. So God creates the world and everything in the world. And in creation, in the garden, we have this perfect world. But humans rebel against God and bring sin and sorrow and suffering into the world. And that's the broken world that we live in. That's the world that we can all acknowledge in some way is broken. Like we don't want it to be. We're 
trying to search for every possible way for this world not to be broken, but deep in our hearts, we know that it is. And so the Bible story, the, what the Bible tells us is that God sent his son to redeem humanity through his death and his burial and his resurrection. And God is restoring all things. He's bringing about a new heaven and a new earth where he will again dwell with his people. And his people will be free from the presence of sin and sorrow and suffering. And so the story of Revelation, what Revelation describes is the consummation of this, uh, the completion of God's redemptive plan for humanity, the ultimate future reality that is ahead. And so Revelation explains how all that became undone in the opening chapters of Genesis are restored. And what a beautiful picture that is, what great hope that is for us. You see, God is reestablishing his kingdom on earth he is re redeeming his people, fallen humanity to live as we were created to live. And the invitation is all through the book of Revelation to um, repent, to come, to join in this kingdom, to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, and to be a part of this humanity. So it's both a message that anticipates the hope that we have, um, the world, what we are living for, and the invitation to be a part of that, to step into the kingdom of God and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. You know, Holly, you are calming my soul so much through this conversation that we're having today. And I'm sure somebody out there is pro probably feeling the same way because, um, you know, there's a, there's hope that we want to have and in Christ. And, and you are just spilling that out to everybody. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. You know, so, you know, I, I really got to ask you though. So what messages does revelation have about good and evil? Good wins. Evil doesn't evil loses. I mean, when all is said and done, this is a story of God who is good, who wins. And what's good about that, what's encouraging about that, and even what's hopeful about that is you and I, we're not the source of good. And there's not anybody out there that we could look to and we could put our hope in to be the source of good. We know that. Like, we might try to tell ourselves something's different, but at the end of the day, we know that. But God, who is the source of good, and is ruler of all, and at the center of the throne, wins. So good wins, and evil doesn't. And that means that what we see, you know, you, you heard me tell these stories, you heard me tell the story of the war-torn country, and some of the difficulties in other places around the world. That means there's vindication, there's restoration, there's reconciliation that takes place. So good wins, evil doesn't. And when you can't see that happening in your day-to-day -day life, when the news seems to be telling you another message, when people seem to want to drive you to something out of fear, the thing we must do is refocus our eyes on the truth of God's word and the hope that we have, because we're not that much different than the people in John's day when he wrote this. We are struggling, we are suffering, we are wondering, how does this all turn out? But that's the message Revelation offers. Good wins, evil doesn't. Amen, amen, Holly. You know, I don't know if anybody has gotten their copy yet, but this is the book of Revelation right here. I mean, it's beautiful. And Holly's got her copy too. I mean, it's I <laughs> amazing. <laughs> and I love the, the way they laid it out this year. I mean, it's got blue color in there and sim all these different symbols. And, you know, right here in the front, just like you were talking about, um, just laid out so wonderfully. And um, there's so many people that are going to learn so much about Revelation this year. And, um, and BSF is offering this to you. Um, 
and it's free and you can go online and you can do, you can do it through zoom and uh, you, you find a group anywhere. And, you know, even the United States or around the world, I mean, it's just touching lives, everybody's life. So, you know, one of my last questions about this would be how have Christians interpreted revelation through time? Well, so there's, there's generally four approaches um, to interpreting revelation. And so there's um, this idea that revelation is something that occurred in the past. Um, it's called the preterist view, and it would be um, up until AD 70. And revelation was something that occurred in the past. There's an idea that revelation or an interpretation that revelation is something that's occurring now, that it would have started with the history of the church from Christ's time on earth with his first coming until his return. And that's the historist view. There's another interpretation of revelation that um, revelation is looking ahead. It's a futurist view. And that idea that revelation prophesies events that will take place in the future. And some read it as symbolic, this idealist view. So it's just symbolic. It's a symbolic look at the Christian versus the world. And what I would say about that is that in BSF, we understand that there are elements of truth in each approach. And what you would see is some would say there's a fifth approach. I've, I've read it and I've heard it called the eclectic approach, recognizing that depending on where you are in the text, you might understand certain things to actually relate to that time that when it was being written or to actually relate during this time of Christ's reign, first and second coming, or to actually still be futuristic in view. Um, and so BSF understands there's an element of truth in each of those approaches. And we make every effort to offer a sound exegesis or explanation of the text each with each text that we encounter in the book. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is going to be an exciting study. And I'm so excited myself because I'm a group leader here in New Jersey. And so I want to ask you a little bit about what happened when you were going through the John study? What happened to you? Were you traveling? What were you doing around that time? Well, so this year uh, for the John study, I did travel. Uh, we actually took a team of BSF staff members uh, on a several week trip throughout Southeast Asia. So we spent time in Taiwan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Singapore. And uh, we were able to meet with host church pastors, with ministry leaders, uh, with BSF leaders and class members worldwide. One of the great, great things that happened on that trip, and there were so, again, I, I could tell stories all day long, so I'm controlling myself. But one of the great <laughs> things that happened on that trip was um, our original Mandarin class for Bible Study Fellowship was in Taiwan, the very first one, more than a decade ago. And so we were able to go visit that class and see the growth in that class and visit many other Mandarin classes that have sprung forward from that class. Um, but the other thing it allowed us to do was just to understand what it's like to do BSF in those cultures and in those contexts. So we had a great time traveling. We had a rich experience as we enriched our own understanding um, we had, an, as I said, this opportunity to meet with ministry leaders that is now producing expansion into Europe and into Mandarin speaking groups in Europe. So we're watching the expansion of the ministry take place, and I'm thankful for that. And then, as you know, I um, I was a part of an online group. So I was a co-leader of an online group this year and got a chance to study John like everybody else does. And that was a huge blessing to me. I love those women that I get to study with and see how God is working in their lives each and every week. So it, it was a good year. It was a you know, it was fun um, and it was it was rich to see what the Lord's doing around the world. And, you know, the Holy Spirit was just showing up this year big time for me and my group. I, I'm sure everybody else, like you were talking about before, it was just such an amazing, it just it was very impactful. It was an impactful mm -hmm. year. And, um, and God was really working. We saw him working. How has your role as executive director strengthened and changed you? 
Mm. Well, um, I would say that it's probably growing me and maybe growing is the word I would use there. Uh, I'm reminded each and every day that um, God's call is not to a set of outcomes. So God didn't call me to this role for a set of outcomes. God has called me to this role to be faithful to him, faithfulness to him. And in leadership and ministry, and especially I think in the kind of ministry that BSF is and maybe other ministry leaders uh, would say the same, it's easy it's possible, I won't say easy, I'll say it's possible. It's possible to lose sight that the call is to faithfulness and not necessarily to outcomes. And so when you, while we want this ministry to grow, while we want this ministry to be the most accessible in-depth Bible study on the planet, that is what we're going after. And we're we're going hard after that. Um, that that's not the call. That's not the great measure of success. The measure of success for myself, my staff, or leaders around the world is to be faithful to our Lord, to walk worthy of his calling, to uh, live in such a way to, to be teachable in such a way that like Paul was saying in Colossians, that we will be fully presented, fully mature before Christ. And so I find myself remembering or making asking God to remind me, not outcomes. Don't measure my don't measure my success in terms of how many people come or how many people don't come, um, but more in who I am and how I walk out my daily life before Him, and to be faithful to Him. Mm. So, how has BSF made changes that reflect the generations coming forward? Because I know things are changing inside even your staff, right? So how is that affecting? Well, um, great question and great mention of our staff. We've had some quite young staff members join us, which gives us a great insight into uh, generational diversity. Maybe I'll say it that way among our staff. But as you look at the, the changes that are happening in the generations right now, it's technology, it's mobility, it's artificial intelligence. It's less about being a certain age and more about the inundation into our culture of what technology, mobility, and artificial intelligence as an extension of technology are doing. And so what I would say is that we're creating ways and continue to solidify ways for people to participate in this ministry in a very flexible way. So our the other thing we're watching in the culture is two incomes are required in many families now, not just one to survive. The cost of living is escalated. The life stages are changing for people. And so BSF Online, which you mentioned earlier, is a great way to participate in Bible study fellowship in a more flexible meeting environment. It means dual income parents can be a part of BSF, even if you can't get to a local income, local in-person class, you might be able to meet at 530 in the morning on a particular day. So we continue to create ways to make this accessible to people, um, certainly people on the early side of their career. So it's not just for the retired person who can, again, get to a local class. You, you can be on the early side of your career. And if you are spending 15 minutes a day scrolling social media, you have time to go to BSF. Like it's that kind of trade-off that that people are making. But the other thing we've done is we've revamped our student program in the last few years. And so it's about a more active type of learning style and the student's active engagement in God's word, which pr produces a passionate commitment to God's truth. So we're looking at how we are approaching our student, the student activities for BSF. In some places you can do participate in BSF as a student online. That's not everywhere yet. So if it's not in your area, um, pray for us and be patient with us. We we hold the protection and the, the care of the student as the highest value, which means in some places we may have held back from students participating online. And if we have, it's about making sure we can protect the student. 
We also have WordGo, which is an app that you can download, anyone can use. And we're actually working on our next generation of WordGo. So be watchful of that. You should hear something before the end of the Revelation study year. Um, but we are evaluating different ways that our technology serves people. We are trying to recognize the mobile lifestyle that people have and create ways for them to still participate. And we think that will catch that will catch people who had to deselect, as certainly in younger life stages in the past. We we think this is a great opportunity for everybody to get involved. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know if everybody knows that they have like the most amazing children's ministry that oh, children, true. the children are just, they're coming out of there singing songs. I that's mean, true. our children's ministry where we are, uh, they, they are just amazing. And I know that, um, that you have great plans for that. Can you speak into that a little bit? Well, absolutely. So we do have an incredible BSF kids or preschool. If you're in the United States, think preschool ministry. Uh, we do that slightly differently around the world, but we also have a kids BSF kids YouTube channel. And if you're not a subscriber to that, go subscribe because we put out uh, lessons that we do actual lessons and some of the hymns and, and stories that we have. So so that preschool program is fantastic. And one of the things that we've started this year, well, that is gaining more momentum. We've actually been doing it for a while, but it's gaining more momentum is that in many communities, we're able to um, have BSF all be on one evening. So the men's group, the women's group, the preschool program and the student program all come together in one location on the same night. And so whether you're a part of a family or not, it's not family BSF, it's BSF for men, for women, for pre, for kids, for students. Um, and some of those groups actually even have young adult satellites. But what one of the things we're doing is we're, we're bringing BSF together in ways that make sense for communities, for families, in a shared location. So you can you can go to bsfinternational.org and you can look to see where that might be happening in your community. You can certainly let us know where you want that to happen in your community. Uh, we are working in that direction. But that, but again, I would just say if you are not, if you're single or maybe you don't have children, it's still BSF. You still go in, you participate in a men's group or a women's group. You're going to hear the lecture from a, the male teaching leader or the female teaching leader. But we also know that sometimes families really only have one night and they could, if it's all on one night, they can go. So we're we're working in that direction as well. And, and those have been very popular and are gaining momentum around the world. That's wonderful. That's wonderful to know. And I'm sure somebody out there is going to hone into that too. And so my final question to you, it's the last one is, what is the one question that people ask you about studying with BSF Bible Study Fellowship? Well, would you allow me the license to actually answer the question? What's the one question I wish people would ask me? Yes. <laughs> because um, the question that I wish people would ask me is um, why, why there's a million Bible studies, why BSF? And I would, I love answering that question because one of the things that I know, and, and I think you can see even through the stories that I've told is that BSF is not just a Bible study. We are not just a 60 minute discussion group or a 36 minute discussion group or a 90 minute meeting. We are not just a Bible study. We are a Bible study fellowship. And we have some things that make us distinct and different from other Bible studies, the way we train our leaders, the, the training that we bring for every single person who comes, and then the leadership that is a part of every BSF group. If you go to BSF, you have a trained leader um, who is is facilitating for you or who is making sure that this group happens in a certain way. The way we teach the word is distinct to other Bible studies and other ministries, this fourfold approach. But on top of that, the way that we teach doctrine makes us quite distinct. 
our commitment to community, our commitment to be the fellowship of community and the way that it works together. So, so we actually don't want people just to run out and buy a book and not be a part of BSF. Sometimes we hear stories about people who are just buying a book and doing their own thing, but that's not recognizing who we are as a ministry. So this commitment we have to community. And then we also have a very distinct commitment to the church because our commitment is we are not the church. We want to take people, we want to train and equip people to be more effective in their churches. And so I talk to pastors all over the world. We're not here to steal your people. We're not here to get them to be more involved with us than they are with you. But we are here as a resource to train people, to teach them the word of God, to help instill habits in these people in, in people who come in order to be more effective in their local church. So we're not here to take people away. So the question I wish people would ask is why should I study NBSF? Why not just do some other study? And I think the things that make us distinct are important and are special and are different enough that every person who can be involved in BSF for a season should be. Would every person who can be involved would benefit for a season. We're not here to hold people forever. So we're not here to grab people and hold on to them tightly. We we see our responsibility, our stewardship in the greater kingdom is to train, is to teach, is to instill a love for and an understanding of doctrine. It is to show people what it looks like to study in community. And ultimately, it is for the benefit of the church, not for Bible study fellowship. So that's what I wish people would ask. And I would love to invite anyone who wants to come. It's very simple to be a part of a BSF group. Wonderful. And if anybody has a question for Holly, just put it in the comments below and I will send it over to Holly. And um, this is the book, the book of Revelation, Rela Revelation, the hope. Um, and that's our study for next year. Beautiful book, lots of pages, you know, come every week because it's, you know, you never know what's going to come. You never know the message that God has for you through his word. And thank you so much for putting this together, Holly. This is wonderful. You can find out more about Bible Study Fellowship at BibleBSFInternational.org or to join a group near you or online by going to MyBSF.org. And you, find, you can find a class there. And BSF is on all social media. And um, that's where you can find them. Um, Holly, what would you like to leave my audience with today? Well, I'd like to say thank you to you, Nancy, for this opportunity. And I would just like to remind people that um, this, we are living in a difficult season and we don't know if Jesus is coming back tomorrow. He didn't, he didn't tell us that, but he has given us, he has offered us hope in the midst of the struggles and he has offered us a, a, a the invitation to fix our eyes on him and not be distracted or panicked by the events around us. So if you have 15 minutes a day to scroll your phone, then you have time for Bible study fellowship. And we would love to have you this year. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Holly Roberts. Be sure to like and subscribe and come back next time for another episode of The Call with Nancy Sebado. See you then.